Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on IR Detector Speed. My name is Desmond Lamont, and I'm the Director for Global Business Development for the Teledyne FLIR Science Vertical. Uh, today, it's going to be the first in a series of webinars covering the five things to know about IR detectors, specifically for research, development, and scientific applications. So let's get started. Just a brief agenda for the sake of brevity, uh, trying to keep this uh, presentation as uh, short as possible to keep you engaged. Uh, so we're only going to be going through a high level introduction of IR uh, with additional depth specifically on the two primary detector types as they relate to speed on this webinar. Uh, to wrap things up, uh, we're going to talk about how the detector differences apply to performance in high speed applications. So what IR products does Teledyne FLIR make? More specifically, you know, what do we make for engineers, scientists, and technicians like yourselves? Well, our cameras operate in the infrared spectrum, uh, located at wavelengths longer than the visible spectrum that most of us are used to seeing with our own eyes. Uh, at FLIR, the infrared spectrum begins at around one micron with the true thermal bands beginning at uh, three micron. Uh, at the shortest wavelengths in the infrared spectrum, we have SWEAR, which is short wave infrared, Located closest to the visible spectrum, SWEAR isn't only good for seeing through materials like glass, but it's also useful for visibility through haze, capturing in-band SWEAR spectral information, seeing through layers of paint, non-destructive uh, testing, engineering. And uh, I want to point out that our SWEAR camera is very linear in response, so we can calibrate it for thermography applications starting at around 400C. Uh, next is Midwave IR. Uh, Midwave is the standard range when it comes to most radiometry and high-performance thermography applications. Uh, it's because the slope of the Planck curve here enables excellent contrast. Uh, the detectors are exceptionally sensitive at, at typically better than 20 millikelvin NEDT. And for many applications, there's enough energy to adequately fill the detector wells to run at uh, high frame rates. And then finally, we have long wave IR. Uh, there are a few different detector technologies that address long wave. Uh, long wave is interesting because there are a lot of photons out there. This is going to enable better measurement of colder temperatures. It's going to enable the use of metallic or silicon-based detectors uh, and allows for cryo-cooled options that achieve very short integration times in comparison to their mid-wave counterparts. Uh, in addition, in the long wave, you can experience fewer sol solar artifacts and other benefits like that. Uh, at the end of the day, all the IR ba wave bands are going to be complementary to one another uh, for the unique capabilities or properties found in each of that spectrum. So for those of you unfamiliar with IR detectors and cameras, uh, taking a look at this chart, starting on the left side, uh, you're going to see common representations of microbolometer-based systems. Uh, these are going to range from very small sensors, like the FLIR Lepton in the bottom left, uh, to the more common handheld uh, cameras used by many people for quick evaluation of a circuit, motor, or re other relatively large or slow target uh, in the middle there. Uh, on the right-hand side of the chart are examples of cryocooled cameras. Uh, these are also called photon counters or quantum detectors. These systems are much higher performance and are typically the models of choice for engineers and scientists due to the flexibility and access to the raw data, which is an important point. Uh, in the center right, uh, going from top to bottom, you see our cooled high definition A8580 camera, which is available with a 1280 by 1024 resolution mid-wave or SLS long wave detector uh, matching format. Uh, below that is an X-series model loaded with connectivity options and the highest frame rates. To the far right is going to be an example of our range science or RS models. These are typically used at open air test ranges or other harsh environments where you want to combine a uh, specific uh, you know, cryo cooled camera, high sensitivity, high speed with a large optic uh, for range. So I'm going to warn you, this slide can get a little busy, but stick with me and we will make it through just fine. Uh, the bar you see before you is a representation of the electromagnetic spectrum, starting with UV at the far left and long wave at the far right. As we move from left to right, wavelengths are going to get longer. Uh, because of the typical ranges we deal with, most of us that work in the infrared are going to refer to wave bands as micrometers. For example, we might say that the near IR band on this chart starts at one micron. Uh, the first thing to note is where we consider the thermal bands to start. This is at three micron and is due in part because reflected light really dominates the signal below three micron. If you remember, I mentioned that our SWEAR camera, we start the calibration range at about 400 C. That's because of all the noise, I'll say, the reflected light that's really dominating that lower than three micron signal uh, in those shorter wavelengths. At three micron and above, the mix shifts and we get a lot of black body radiation dominating, which vastly improves your uh, potential signal uh, noise ratio. Uh, here's where things are gonna get a little bit busy. There are uh, 
these are the most uh, common detector materials, you know, types for infrared. You have ingas or indium gallium arsenide as the most popular choice for SWIR, indium antimonide or INSBI for both broadband and standard midwave. Uh, broadband, if you're not familiar, just means that it covers a wider range. In this case, it means that it gets down to roughly one micron wavelength and as high as roughly five micron. And I say roughly uh, because the detector material, design of the total detector, uh, the exact window specs, those are going to influence the exact cutoff you know, ranges. Uh, another popular choice has been MCT or Mercad uh, Telluride. However, while it's very sensitive material, uh, it can be quite temperamental with respect to drift. Uh, for long wave, the most common is going to be the microbolometer, which is a silicon or metallic based uh, material. Uh, bolometers are different from other materials listed here because they're not actively cooled. Uh, all of the materials that address mid-wave and long wave uh, wave bands, uh, uh, other than that, are going to be cryo-cooled down to roughly 77 Kelvin. Uh, we call these uh, cooled cameras, again, photon counters or quantum detectors. Uh, a more recent cryo-cooled material for the industry is going to be SLS, a strain layer super lattice. Uh, this material allows us to have a high performance long wave detector that addresses some of the negative aspects of MCT, like that drift, in trade for a slight decrease in uh, sensitivity. Uh, there, we made it through all that. Uh, now you can, might be wondering with all these options, what should I choose? Well, the good news is that the market is basically standardized on the use of ingas for SWIR, INSBI for midwave, and bolometers for long wave. Uh, not in all cases, but that's the, the most common, that's gonna be 95% of the market or so. Uh, Though I will say that in long wave or really any wave band, it's going to depend on your application requirements, which you want to specifically choose uh, to solve your problem. Uh, having an understanding, though, of the most common detector types that we'll go over in these uh, webinar series, uh, such as microbolometers and uh, the cryo-cooled photon counters, is going to help you move past the most important aspects of selecting an IR detector for your application. So let's talk about microbolometers. Before we get into this, you might ask why options even exist since they appear to do the same thing. I mean, why have so many options when you're just converting the same scene into, enter, into a temperature reading? Isn't the problem already solved? Well, to that I'd say that yes, both bolometer and cryocooled options are designed to capture incident radiation and convert it into data values, typically temperature, radiant intensity, what have you. Uh, but the way that they go about it is wildly different. And due to the approach, different capability requirements are going to be addressed. Uh, you can liken it to standard transportation versus a high-performance sports car, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself with that. Uh, microbolometers, also known as power or thermal detectors, are going to read the incident radiation as a change in resistance across the detector element. If you look to the bottom right, you can see a close-up picture of an element or a pixel, uh, again in the bottom right of the screen. Uh, the detector is going to consist of a, an array of those elements made up of metal or semiconductor material, uh, morphous silicon, uh, or vanadium oxide, um, uh, which, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, could be one of those mixes. But the, the plate is going to be suspended in the air, as you see in the image, at about two micron above the reflective substrate, and that creates a quarter wave resonance cavity, effectively tuning that detector uh, to be sensitive, uh, the peak of the sensitivity to be at around 10 micron wavelength. Uh, though the detector is typically sensitive or responsive from seven and a half to about 14 micron. Uh, the supporting legs that you see there are also connected to the voltage source. So when looking at a target scene, that incident radiation is going to be focused onto these elements via a lens or an optic onto these pixels, causing it to be heated, which is going to uh, change the resistance of the material. The change in resistance can then be measured and calibrated to temperature values, which then are presented as an IR image of the scene. So I mentioned that bolometer cameras are typically sensitive to the 7.5 to 14 micron wave band. There are a few reasons for this, one being that there are atmospheric transmission problems from 5.5 to 7.5 uh, that cause considerable degradation and attenuation in your signal. That's going to be called the water band, and it's avoided by most detectors, whether they're mid-wave or long wave. Uh, another reason is that there are plenty of photons in the long wave, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, in a future webinar, we'll talk about sensitivity in more depth but since this applies to the bolometer speed limitations, I'll mention it here as well. Uh, bolometers are going to be tuned again to peak at sensitivity of 10 micron. Uh, this is due to the Planck's curve peaking at 10 micron for ambient temperature things around 30 C. So what does that really have to do with speed with the bolometer? Well, bolometers, like many designed things, have to make performance trade-offs. And for them, sensitivity has to be prioritized. In a moment, we'll talk about thermal time constants. But 
we're taking we're talking about a design where both the speed and sensitivity are going to be inversely proportional to the thermal resistance so a sensitive bolometer is often a slow bolometer uh, i'd like to repeat that bolometers they are specifically tuned to be as sensitive as possible where the highest energy is available and in doing so they inherently limit the potential speeds and this is really tied to that thermal time constant so here's a thought experiment you know consider two buckets of water one is full of ice water sitting at zero c the other filled with boiling water 100 c very nice step function if you will uh, we point the microbolometer camera at the ice water to get a reading and instantaneously switch to the boiling water for that nice step function and plot the resulting temperature on the chart on the right of the screen uh, for this graph we're using half steps of roughly seven milliseconds each so we can follow the progression over the five time constants more closely after a half time constant the microbolometer is going to report 50 c or roughly half the actual temperature of the boiling water you can see how this is going to be problematic for high speed things uh, after another seven milliseconds the microbolometer is going to report a temperature of 75 c it'll continue increasing by half again over and over uh, until you get closer uh, to 100 c with each half step now consider the temperature reading at a full step between 8 and 12 milliseconds on the graph you can see that the microbolometer uh, read the temperature of the boiling water at around 60 c of, and that was an error of about 40 c uh, the camera is still accurately reporting the temperature of the pixel the problem is that the pixel itself did not have enough time to reach the temperature of the scene it was measuring, and it still needs about four more time constants to reach the stable temperature back to equilibrium. Uh, now let's consider a more dynamic scene. In this example, we had a simple step function, but if the scene was rapidly changing temperature up and down, uh, your target is moving around and temperature, uh, lots of transient, you can see how difficult it would be for the bolometer to provide accurate data or even clean imagery. A final view of the bolometer is the fact that they entail a rolling shutter. Uh, typically, when you think of speed, you think of frame rate, but that's a byproduct of exposure time or integration time. Uh, what you see here is the detector from a FLIR T1020 uh, high-definition handheld camera. We used one of our cryo-cooled SLS long-wave cameras to capture the view of this, uh, the, this readout, since it can see through the same long-wave IR-friendly material, uh, the windows, uh, to record the detector uh, action. As you can see here, bolometers read out row by row. It doesn't take an impressive demonstration to consider how that type of readout can cause problems for capturing high-speed events. By reading out row by row, the detector is going to provide the time uh, required for the pixels to return to thermal equilibrium. And you might ask what the integration time actually is for a bolometer in order to evaluate it for your event or application uh, speed requirement. So this is pretty simple. Uh, max integration time is going to be dependent on frame rate and on the number of rows of the bolometer because we're rowing, we're reading through each of those rows. So for an example, let's say a 640 by 480 resolution sensor and a frame rate of 30 hertz, that's going to provide integration times of about 70 microseconds. Um, this is calculated by taking one over the number of rows over the frame rate that you see in that the little window there. Uh, you can run the bolometer at a shorter integration time, but most bolometers don't actually offer that level of control to any users. Uh, let's suppose they did though. Uh, since we can't ignore the thermal time constants that are intrinsic to the bolometer design, when considering a fast event, a good rule of thumb is to ensure that the event is slower or let's say longer than 60 milliseconds. This is to ensure that you have the time to read again the change, remember the slow arc of four to five thermal time constants, and again, you have the time for the detector re to return to thermal equilibrium to accurately capture the next frame. Again, if enough time hasn't been allowed to pass, that residual charge is gonna be carried over to the next frame, resulting in blurring or thermal smear. Uh, I'll also add a caveat that while this is a decent rule of thumb, it's not a hard and fast rule and can be very detector dependent. So you're gonna need to try that out. Uh, thermal time constant uh, is clearly the challenge for bolometers when it comes to going faster. So you might ask why this hasn't been addressed yet. Well, we talked about this on a previous slide, but I'll repeat it again since it's key to understanding the speed limitations of the bolometer. Uh, the detector response, again, is directly related to the thermal resistance and any efforts to decrease that thermal uh, resistance, let's say thin the detector element, decrease the size of the element, it's going to have a directly proportional effect on the sensitivity. Uh, bringing it to an unacceptable level. So if you remember, we needed to tune these detectors very specifically to make them operate at the, the level of sensitivity that's required by the market and by industry. And so uh, there, it's, it's a, needless to say, this is a non-trivial engineering challenge. Uh, 
you know, for the entire industry. So this is where we are with bolometers today. This brings us to photon counters. Now, before we get into the detector, I wanted to address what each of you might think of when it comes to a cryo-cooled system. On the left, we have your classic pore-filled doer that's cooled by use of liquid, liquid nitrogen, hence the pore-filled name. Uh, on the right, we have an example of a closed cycle Stirling cooler. So that's gonna be a Stirling engine, helium, you know, powered, that kind of thing. For the following few slides, when we talk about the design, I'm just gonna be talking about the closed cycle cooling system. Uh, but good news, the focus of this talk is on the detector, not the cooling methodology. So the detector is what makes the difference in frame rate and other higher performance capabilities. In large part, the detector is going to be the same regardless of cooling method, though there may be performance differences based on the electronics package, the ROIC, et cetera, that are used. Uh, let's dig on into the, uh, the cryocool detectors. So here are what the parts actually look like inside a cryocooled camera, specifically one that incorporates a linear cooler, as you see on the bottom left. Uh, other DDCA agent uh, designs uh, will look different due to the use of a rotary cooler versus the linear one that you see here on the left. If we move from left to right, you'll see a small pipe leading from the cooling engine up to a tube, somewhat covered by that red bracket. Uh, as you can see from the breakout images on the right, this tube is called the cold finger and is what connects the detector in order to bring it down to that typical 77 Kelvin operating temperature we mentioned. Uh, the FPA or focal plane array is where the incident IR energy is captured, converted into an electrical charge, eventually converted into a digital signal and the resulting data imagery. Uh, additionally, you see the cold stop and the cold shield uh, on there. And that's typically what we're gonna use for starting to window down to that three to five micron, or let's say to that, you know, seven and a half to 12 if we're using SLS long wave. So here's a view of the detector. The actual detector is a combination of two components, um, the detector material uh, or photon diodes and the readout uh, integrated circuit, which is also called the ROIC. Uh, cool detectors are also called hybrid detectors because of this. Now, effectively, they're gonna take the exotic focal plane array material, for example, INSBI or in indium antimonide, and sandwich it with the ROIC via an array of indium bumps. At the bottom of the chart, you see a simple diagram of the unit cell, each with its own integration capacitor. Uh, each pixel in the detector array is a unit cell, so you can take a minute to imagine a 1280 by 1024 array of integration capacitors uh, to help you out with the next uh, couple slides. Uh, as you can tell, this is very different from the more basic bolometer design. With a photon, photon counter, the user is going to be able to set the integration time or exposure time. Uh, when incident energy strikes that FPG, uh, FPA, uh, electrons are kicked over to the integration capacitor, which in turn uh, collects energy for the duration of that set integration time. And this gives the user very tight control over the quality of the image uh, that's being captured, and even more so, very tight control over timing and frame rates for a given scene, which is very important for high-speed captures. Since this can be difficult for those of us without electrical engineering backgrounds you know, to conceptualize, I present to you the buckets in the rain analogy. Uh, at the bottom, you see examples of an integration capacitor. Since these represent a pixel, you can imagine again an array of these buckets matching a typical detector resolution, say 640 by 512 or 1280 by 1024, what have you. Uh, in the analogy, uh, rain represents the photons produced by the scene. In a cold scene, fewer photons are gonna be produced, in, in which case we're gonna fill the buckets at a slower rate. But in a hot scene, many photons will be produced filling the bucket or pixel more rapidly. When we read out the detector, we would take the amount of uh, rain or photons collected to produce our image. And this brings us to the concept of well fill. So well fill is a term that you see on cooled detector spec sheets, and it refers to how much energy the capacitor can collect. Uh, think of it as the depth of the given detector unit cell. Uh, it can also be used as an active percentage amount of fill, like when calculating NEDT and how we're using it in this rain example. Uh, shallow well fill, uh, will rapidly fill in many instances where a deeper well is going to take longer. Pretty intuitive. A uh, simple way of looking at it is that the fuller the well at time of integration, the more energy collected and typically the better imagery. Uh, back to the cold scene above, a longer integration time is going to be required to attain a high enough well fill. This would inherently begin limiting the speed at which you're going to be able to capture versus the hot scene where the target well fill is reached much faster, enabling those faster frame rates. Compared to a bolometer, the integration times can be drastically shorter at a few hundred nanoseconds or less, uh, though typically the recommended minimum or the, the, the 
the actual minimum in practice is typically going to be 10 microseconds, maybe a little bit less or so, uh, because people start applying ND filters to control that energy flow uh, and maintain best performance and the most accurate data on those detectors. So here's a simple animation to pull it all together. Uh, as in-band photons you know, from the target scene are captured by the integration capacitors, the user or factory calibration, let's say, identifies and applies the most appropriate integration time for optimal well fill. The detector is read, digitizing the data and clearing the capacitors fully, and the data is converted to a temperature value and presented as an IR image. Uh, the design of the detector, it's gonna inherently provide a much faster response with tight control over the timing, thus enabling those very fast frame rates and short integration times. Not only do we get shorter integration times and faster frame rates when comparing photon counters to bolometers, but another important capability is windowing. This is where you can select a subregion of the detector to trade off overall resolution for speed, uh, which is a typical trade, right, in, in any kind of data acquisition application. Uh, depending on the ROIC design, though, speed improvements can come from windowing horizontally, vertically, or both. Not all ROICs are designed the same, uh, so they have their own key, uh, characteristics. Uh, the user can also have the option of placing the window uh, where they want on the specific detector, maybe to avoid some bad pixels, or maybe there's a certain place in the uh, field of view that they want to target, and it's hard to move the camera at the right angle. Regardless, they have a lot of flexibility. So more than that, the higher performance timing, uh, the higher performance timing capabilities uh, are going to enable full camera designers to uh, the ability to implement more advanced recording options and connectivity, all of which are going to result in a much more flexible, high performance platform uh, to meet the most uh, difficult challenges. So what does this mean for your specific application? Well, Fast frame rates, again, they're going to be a side benefit of short integration times and analogous to uh, shutter speed. Uh, this means that cooled cameras are going to image the same scene temperature as a bolometer camera much faster. And this allows you to stop motion and avoid image blur on fast moving targets. The following images illustrate this by stopping motion on helicopter in flight and on a fan blade, top and bottom imagery, respectively. Uh, the bolometer image can't stop the uh, distant helicopter blades in the top left image, and instead you see the blurry carryover from that charge we talked about. Uh, on the right, you can see the arrow heating on the actual helicopter blades and take measurements. Uh, on the bottom images, uh, the bolometer can't even detect the fan blades due to the longer integration times that it has to deal with. Uh, now, nothing against bolometers. They're great for general purpose applications. Uh, they're rugged, they're you know very portable and handheld designs, uh, but when it comes to speed, they're just not designed for, for higher speed applications. For example, a bolometer would have a lot of trouble seeing the ejection of this casing or that amazing heat transfer that occurs in the suppressor at the far right of the image on this rifle barrel. Uh, this was a shoot with guns and ammo that, that FLIR did uh, where we were taking a look at that suppressor specifically on the right. You know, some of you, you've probably seen this imagery before, but if not, it's a capture of a heated and dropped golf ball. Uh, as in the other images, here we have a similar resolution, cooled and bolometer detector, you know, both 640 by 480, 640 by 512, so very close in resolution, so it's not the resolution that we're seeing here. Uh, but, and they're both running at 60 hertz, so it's not the frame rate either. Uh, on the far left, the bolometer image is clearly smearing due to the speed of the ball versus the speed of the camera. Uh, so obviously none of that data is going to be accurate. And if you want to see what that data looks like up close, uh, here we have the data. Uh, you can see again how the smeared image doesn't even accurately reflect the surface of the ball. Uh, here we have the data displayed in FLIR Research Studio software uh, with both data files playing on the left with the region of interest line profiles placed across each ball. On the right, we have both of these line profiles displayed on the chart with the bolometer in green and the cooled camera in red. If you take a look at the green bolometer line, uh, not only does it have a wide disparity of apparent temperature readings, but you can't even tell where the ball begins or ends. Uh, so you don't even get a clear picture of the target that you're looking at uh, from just a data perspective. Uh, with the cooled camera, the shape is clear, the data is great, and the imagery is, is pretty impressive. Uh, so it's very, very useful for that. Um, so one final thought on high-speed IR. You know, when considering high-speed applications, you need to factor in the expected temperature range of the targets you want to measure. Thinking back to the bucket in the rain uh, cold scene, 
If your targets are cooler, the camera will be integration time limited and not able to achieve the specified maximum frame rate. On the left side of the chart, you see some typical integration times at different temperature ranges. And as, as expected, the integration time decreases or shortens as the temperature range increases. Uh, what if you wanted to go really fast though? Just as with high-speed visible cameras, you need enough energy in the scene to make a good capture. The difference being that high-speed visible cameras use bright exterior lighting synchronized to the capture to ensure a good image. Whereas the, with IR, the only available lighting is from the target itself. So you're very limited by that. Uh, let's take a look at some integration time requirements for different hot rates. If you take a look here, we've got you know one kilohertz, required integration time is gonna have to be a maximum of one millisecond. At two kilohertz, it cuts in half, half a millisecond. And as you carry on, we get all the way down to the point where you know 20 microseconds, and you can tell your target's gonna have to be very hot to make use of those kind of speeds. Uh, your frame rate, it's going to be integration time dependent and your integration time is gonna be tied to your target temperature. There are other aspects like emissivity that can add more complexity to the capture uh, as well. So make sure that you speak with somebody knowledgeable about your application to ensure all these aspects have been taken into account in order to meet your application requirements and get the results that you need. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar on speed, five things to know about IR detectors.